right, going to have your uh, textbooks open to page 251. We didn't have a chance to do a lot of math yesterday in our last lesson. Uh, I kind of ran out of time. But I um, want to get to that here in just a moment. First, let's review what we talked about from chapter 16 yesterday. Begin talking about a wave in class. We said a wave is simply a transfer of energy, energy through what type of medium? An elastic medium, and a medium that is capable of going back to its original position. And so that transfer of energy through the elastic medium class we call a wave. wave. Good. And we talked about specifically waves in which as the wave progresses forward, the particles move perpendicular to the direction that the energy is traveling. We call these waves class? Trans Transverse. Transverse waves. What is it class? Transverse. Transverse waves. That's where the particles are, for instance, up and down while the wave moves forward. It doesn't have to be up and down. It can be side to side. But the particles are moving perpendicular to the wave's energy direction. Uh, we said for a transverse wave, the high point of the wave is referred to class as the? Crest. And the low point is called the? Trough. trough. Now, if you were to take the perfectly undisturbed state of the medium and measure to the crest or measure down to the trough, that displacement from the equilibrium position, that undisturbed state, is called the amplitude, okay, the amplitude of the wave. Now, if we had just a single disturbance, maybe just a crest that sort of moves along a line, or just a trough that moves along a line, a single disturbance isn't actually a wave class, it's simply called a wave pulse, a wave pulse. And then a wave actually consists of Two pulses, specifically, opposite, two opposite wave pulses, is what actually constitutes a wave. Uh, we said if you had lots of waves, well, more than one wave, traveling through the same medium, you would have something called a wave train. And if you were to measure from the crest of one wave to the crest of the next wave, or trough to trough, or really any point at the same point on the next wave, that distance between corresponding points on consecutive waves is called wave length. It gives you the length of the wave. So again, from crest to the next crest class is called wavelength. What do we use to represent, I just realized I left this horse's light bulb and battery pack, I assume, sort of, uh, on here. Um, uh, yeah, what, what symbol do we use to represent wavelength class? Lambda. Lambda is used to represent wavelength. And uh, if you were to uh, be watching water waves out on the edge of a pier or something, and you see where one wave starts, you can see the crest, we can see the next crest, you can see kind of what the wavelength is, and you watch and you time from where the first crest passes until the next crest gets there. That would be the time for one wave to completely pass the given point. What term refers to the time for a wave to pass a given point? Period. And we measure period in? Seconds. Now, the period is the exact opposite of how many waves could pass in a given second, right? The, the more time it takes for one wave to move, the uh, fewer waves can pass in a given period of time. We said the number of waves that could pass a given point in one second is called frequency. frequency. We represent frequency with the letter F. And it's important to remember that frequency is measured in hertz or reciprocals of seconds. By the way, I didn't mention this, but wave length is measured in class. It's a length? Oh, meters. meters. Or here in the US of A, feet, feet right? We either measure it in meters or feet, usually meters. And uh, hertz, remember we said, that's the same thing as per second. And I said that if you were to take the wave length times the frequency, that would be meters times per second, or meters per second class, that would be the wave speed. We represent it with letter V, and there was one of our equations from yesterday that we'll be using here in just a moment, V equals lambda F. The, short, the, the bigger the wave length and the higher the frequency, the faster the wave's speed is. Uh, we talked, though, about wave speed also in the sense of waves traveling through a wire or through a cord or something. And we said that uh, two things primarily affect how quickly a wave can travel through a cord or through a wire. What are those two things, Kendall? I could take a rope, for instance, if I were cool. I could attach a rope to that pole there, and I could shake it. And I could, the waves would travel at different speeds depending on two things. 
The thickness, if you will, of the rope, how fat it is. We technically say mass per unit length, but thickness, for all practical purposes. Thicker rope will have a slower speed of wave traveling through it because there's more particles for the energy to displace. Uh, the other factor, though, Audrey, was? The distance of your rope to the pole. No, that will affect the wavelength, but it won't affect wave speed directly, necessarily. Um, the type of material? Uh, not really even that, though mass per unit length included in that, I suppose. Can you remember the other one? Is that how fast you <laughs> Not necessarily. The tension, right? So I said think of stringed instruments, right? The tighter you pull a string, the higher the frequency comes out. And we could think of the wave perhaps as traveling through at a faster speed. It's not entirely accurate, but if that helps you remember it. So tension affects it. If I pull the rope a little tighter and start shaking it versus a looser rope shaking it. So we said tension and thickness or mass per unit length, which incorporates both type of material and the thickness. We generally think thickness. Affects wave speed, which gives us a second equation for wave speed, specifically in this case through a connector. We remember now that we've reviewed tension and thickness or mass per unit length what that equation is. Square root of F over mu. F sub G over mu. Where the mu again is that thickness, that mass per unit length of kilograms per meter. Um, so those were the two equations we needed to know. All right, so let's take a look at some of the math then using these equations. Then we'll continue our discussion of waves. Uh, page 251, look at problem number two and read that for us if you would, Michael. Waves along a string have a period of 0 0.04 seconds. What is their frequency? So it gives us a period. It asks for the frequency. I guess technically there is one more equation, though it kind of goes back to something we talked about before. What is the relationship between period and frequency class? No. They're reciprocals. So frequency is the reciprocal of period. Period is the reciprocal of frequency. So since they gave me the period class to find the frequency, I just got to take the reciprocal. And what do we get for the frequency of waves that have a period of 0 0.04 seconds? 25 and frequency measured in hertz. Period in seconds, frequency in per second, or hertz. Questions on number two. We'll look at problem number four. Read that for us if you would, Audrey. Um, like, um, number four? Like, yeah. If the wave speed along a piano wire with a mass per unit length of 0 0.023 kilograms per meter is 100 meters per second, what is the tension? Oh, now this is interesting because normally, right, in the, in the example problem we worked yesterday, they gave us the tension, they gave us the mass per unit length, we divided into the square root, boom, we're done. But here they tell us the speed of the waves, and they tell us the mass per length, and they want us to find the tension. Audrey, what do I have to do to get this tension by itself? Square root of um, and multiply by mu. Good. Square both sides to knock the square root off, giving us v squared over here. Multiply by the mu, and that's going to be the tension. So that's not bad. Square the speed, multiply by the mass per unit length. And uh, what do we get for the tension that is apparently in this piano wire, given that speed and that thickness, if you will? Audrey? Um, 220. Um, it's tension. It's a force. Newtons. 220 newtons is correct. All right, questions on number four. Do we see how we can rearrange even an equation like this one? Not super nice rearranging that one. This one's not bad, right? Um, but that one's a little messy, but not bad. Uh, number six, go ahead and read that one for us, Kendall. Why is the wavelength of waves with the frequency of 5,000 hertz seems to be 100 meters So they give us a frequency, they give us the wave's speed, and they ask for the wave length. What equation relates those three things, Kendall? Um, wave speed, frequency, and wavelength. <laughs> There's only a couple of twos from B equals mm -hmm. lambda, but it wanted the wavelength. So how am I going to rearrange this equation? Um, v over lambda. I'm finding wavelength. Mm -hmm. V over F yeah. equals lambda, right? If the wa lambda is the wavelength. So let's take the wave speed divided by the frequency. And uh, go ahead and do that at your seats. The wave speed divided by the frequency. And what do we get for the wave length? Okay. Um, point 
Good, and it is only one sig fig, by the way. Did you notice that? 0 0.02, which is your one sig fig. And what do we use for wavelength? Or which one do I use here? Feet, because it mentioned the speed in feet per second, which means that the wavelength will be in feet. So we said that 0 0.02 feet, our answer for this one. Uh, number eight, Michael, read that one for us. Mm, what is the wave speed of waves with a wavelength of 6.43 times 10 to the negative third and meters and increasing to 520 seconds? All right, so I think these uh, might be sound waves, I'm not sure. No, sound waves travel way faster than this. So this is some other wave. But anyway, very small wavelength, right? Six millimeter wavelength. So very, very small wavelength. Pretty high frequency, 540 hertz at your seats. Find the wave speed. Answer here, Michael. Good. That's and then we uh, want to cut it off at how many sig figs? Two sig figs. So we get and it's wave speed. So good. How many at the three point five meters per second? All right. Questions on these problems? And didn't get a chance to do a lot with this yesterday. Didn't get a chance to practice them last night for homework. You'll practice them tonight for homework. We wanted to make sure I went over these with you before we moved on. Any questions on what we talked about yesterday and then a little bit reviewing here today on waves? All right, so let's move on. The next thing in your notes, different classifications of waves uh, based on the way in which they travel. There's different properties that these waves will have. So classification of wave kind of based on the medium of the wave as well. Uh, we have one, two, and three dimensional waves. So let's start by talking about one dimensional waves one-dimensional waves. One-dimensional waves are those waves which propagate along a wire or a connector. Waves which propagate along a wire or a connector. Uh, for instance, in the old days, the telegraph carried waves, if you will, sound waves along wires, right? That sound wave traveled along a straight line in one direction. If you could tap into that wire, you could hear the signal coming from the telegraph office. If you were standing next to the wire, you heard nothing, all right? It traveled in a singular direction. Now, the benefit of a one-dimensional wave is that one-dimensional wave theoretically will not weaken. A one-dimensional wave will not weaken because it can only travel in one direction. Assuming that medium continues to carry the wave, it continues onward. Whereas you've noticed, for instance, water waves as you, they get further and further from, for instance, the boat, the motorboat as it travels, right? Big waves right next to it, and the waves kind of diminish as they go outward. That doesn't happen with a one-dimensional wave. Water waves are an example of a two-dimensional wave, a two-dimensional wave, where the water waves travel outward in both directions, right? For instance, if you drop a pebble into a, into a, a, a puddle or something like this, or you know, my kids like, uh, there's, you know, different lakes and stuff in town. You like throwing and watching them, boink, and then the wave travels outward, correct? Well, this is a wave which travels outward. Water waves are a good example of this, but a wave which travels outward in all directions. Travels outward in all directions, but it's confined to a plane. The surface of the water is where you will see those waves. It travels outward in all directions along a plane. Not plane as an airplane, but plane as in flat surface. And because it travels outward, it's going to have the strongest wave right initially at the source. And then as the waves, because the waves are spreading out, the waves have to weaken because you've got all this energy in a concentrated spot. Now the energy is in a bigger spot, so it's spread out more. It's diluted more and more, if you will. As it spreads outward, the wave weakens. And so you know if you drop the rock or something, the waves sort of weaken as they go along. So these are your two-dimensional waves. These ones will weaken as they spread outward. But again, these are confined to a plane, right? The interface, if you will, between air and water is where you'll see these waves. Now, with these water waves, 
Not all water waves are necessarily two-dimensional. For instance, the way the tides come in pull the waves in a pretty much singular direction. Now, based on the way the sandbars are positioned out there, you might notice it looks like waves are coming from different angles, but they're all kind of coming all in a line together. Those would still be considered one-dimensional waves, even though they're not in the wire connector because they're traveling in one direction still. They're not really spreading out. The wave is being pushed along by wind and tide. So water waves, two-dimensional for the most part, right? If you're, in a, if you're in a pool and you start splashing, you send waves outward in all directions. Okay, so granted, wind and tide kind of changes this a little bit, but for the most part, there's your two-dimensional waves. Three-dimensional waves. These are not confined to a plane or an interface between media. Three-dimensional waves, for instance, would be, for instance, sound waves. Imagine if sound waves were one-dimensional. The sound comes out of my mouth and literally travels in a perfectly straight line coming out of my mouth. None of you would hear what I'm saying right now. Now, right now, Kendall would hear what I'm saying because my mouth is aimed right at her ear, and then Audrey would hear what I'm saying. And I'm like, Isn't that silly? Obviously, sound waves don't travel in a straight line in a single direction. In fact, I could talk, and you can still hear me behind you, right? So we can tell the sound wave travels outward in all directions, but aren't you glad it's not even two-dimensional? Where, for instance, my mouth is above all of your heads right now because you're sitting down. Kendall would never hear anything. <laughs> I mean, if I got down at her level, now the sound waves like water waves travel outward in an interface. Well, that's not the case, right? Sound waves, for instance, in air travel outward in all directions. Obviously three-dimensionally, hence three-dimensional wave. And because that's true, remember how we said that a two-dimensional wave will weaken as it spreads out? It's only traveling outward along a plane. Sound waves are traveling outward spherically, if you will. Does that make sense? These three-dimensional waves are going to weaken very quickly. Three-dimensional waves are going to weaken quickly. This is why, for instance, if you're standing right next to the PE teacher when he blows the whistle, you're like, ah, my ear. And if you're, you know, at the back of your squad, for instance, it doesn't hurt as bad. And if you're on the other side of the field, you're cool. You don't really mind at all, right? Because it weakens so quickly as we go outward. Um, again, sound were two-dimensional. I'd have to be down on your ear level for the sound. I would go outward in all directions. But again, it's three-dimensional wave. Travels outward in all directions. Sound is also, though, not, if you will, a series of peaks and valleys, right? It's, it's not a series of crests and troughs. Rather, what sound does, is, as I emit sound, right, comes from the lungs, from the diaphragm, it pushes air through the vocal cords, and what it does is it pushes air molecules into each other, and they kind of vibrate like this. And it hits your eardrum and it makes your eardrum go like this. Your eardrum isn't doing this. Your eardrum is simply going back and forth. And of course, we call that your, your hearing, right? Your perception of the sound that's coming from my mouth. And over time, like when you're a little baby, you hear sound, it's sound. Then you begin to associate sounds when you hear no. That sound means don't do it. Stop that, right? And there's ways that parents can help you to realize that no really means that, right? And uh, you hear different sounds and you, you hear different words and you begin to learn that this particular sound, physics, is a pleasant sound. It brings a smile to your face. Physics. Pleasant word. He's smiling. That's a grimace. Anyway, <laughs> um, but you learn what different sounds mean and you, of course, learn to interpret them. But sound is simply a series of, if you will, causes vibrations of the eardrum. It's because sound is what we call a longitudinal wave longitudinal wave. A longitudinal wave, the particles don't move up and down as the wave travels forward, like for instance water waves do. As the energy radiates outward from the splashing person, thrashing in the pool, all right, the waves travel outward from that person, um, but the water's going up and down, up and down. Longitudinal waves, the particles don't go up and down as the wave moves forward, but rather they go back and forth in line with the wave. So if you will, particles oscillate parallel to wave direction. Particles oscillate parallel to wave direction. Or you could say in line with wave direction. Now, again, in a three-dimensional wave, it's all directions. So they're oscillating back and forth in all directions outward along a curved wave front. If we're looking at page, page, 
page, there it is, page 242 and 243. Right, we see how the wave fronts spread outward in all directions, but there's that series of compression and rarefactions. Those two pulses, if you will jot those in your notes with longitudinal waves, the particles are oscillating, they're bouncing back and forth as the wave travels outward. A compression pulse is a point at which the particles are pressed together. Compression, they're pressed together. So when particles are closer together in a longitudinal wave, we call it the compression pulse. But in response to a bunching up, remember, it's not particles that are moving, right? So for instance, it's not the air molecules from my mouth making it all the way to your ear. Okay, that would be kind of weird, okay? The particles of air that are disturbed from my mouth, they oscillate. But as they push outward, they push the next air molecules, push the next air molecules, push the, ne push the next air molecules, if you will. But as they push, they, everything tends toward equilibrium. Even air, to an extent, is an elastic medium. So then the molecules to regain equilibrium spread back outward. The spreading outward pulse is called the rarefaction pulse. Rarefaction pulse. Not rare fractions, okay? It's unfortunate they're not rare. Anyway, rarefaction pulse. Compression, they bunch together. Rarefaction, they spread out. They've got this um, diagram here of a uh, springy thingy uh, on a frictionless support, which doesn't technically exist, but if it could, and uh, you have this uh, vibrating strip, you'd see how the compressions kind of bunch up and spread out and things like that. I can't quite replicate exactly what they're showing there, frankly, because we have a friction uh, a, a surface that has friction, but um, that thing's in the way. What I can do is kind of spread this outward. Now, right now, everything's at equilibrium. You see all the particles, if you want to call it that, spread outward. Did you see as I released a little bit, what I did was I released a bunchedness, and the bunchedness seems to travel. Now, obviously, that doesn't mean that the pieces of the slinky travel, right? But as I released a, a bunched up, see, I've got a bunch of them here. As I re <clears throat> Stay. As I release a bunch, that bunch pushes on the... Um, on the next part, which bunches and bunches, you can see it traveling. Now, in theory, if I then bunch like that, I can also send the pulse rippling down. Now, what you just saw a minute ago was it bounced off. We're going to talk about that in a second. Do you see it bounce back and forth? If I pull it outward, I'm producing a single rarefaction pulse. And again, it looks like the energy travels along because the energy does. The particles don't, but the energy does. Does that make sense? So again, the energy is moving this way, and the, the particles appear to move that way. Really, all they do is oscillate and regain equilibrium that way. So that's a longitudinal wave. So if the particles are moving perpendicular to wave direction class, that is a <coughs> transverse wave. If the particles oscillate parallel to wave direction or in line with the wave, if you will, that's longitudinal, longitudinal waves. Good. And again, sound waves would be a longitudinal wave, a series of compressions and rarefactions that cause your eardrum to vibrate in kind, and uh, you hear. Questions on longitudinal waves? All right. Well, one of the things we want to talk about next, wave behaviors, we actually just witnessed here a moment ago. So next section here, that's wave behaviors. Wave behaviors. Waves do different things when they uh, encounter different things. One of the wave behaviors is called reflection. Reflection. So the first wave behavior, Roman number one or number one or letter A, however you want to do it, is reflection. Here's your technical definition for reflection. Reflection is the turning back of a wave. The turning back of a wave. Huh, it helped to go back to the full screen again here. All right. The turning back of a wave when it strikes a surface. The turning back of a wave when it strikes a surface. What we saw a moment ago with the longitudinal wave was as I released the wave, the compression pulse traveled along, but then we saw it bounce back, right? It struck my hand and it reflected backward again, right? That's reflection of a wave. If a, uh, a transverse wave even were to propagate along, strike a surface, it would bounce off of the surface, unless it's an absorbent surface, right? They make soundproofing materials that are designed to absorb sound rather than reflect it. Sound panels in rooms that are very echoey, for instance, we're gonna get to that in a second. Uh, if you would write this term in parentheses, bouncing. It's a very untechnical term, but associate reflection with bouncing. 
when a wave reflects off of something, it is bouncing off of that thing. Uh, not terribly unlike, for instance, if I threw a ball against the wall, it would bounce off. Now, if I threw the ball straight against the wall, it would bounce straight off, right? We, we know that to be true. But if I were to hit the, ball, the board over there, what would happen to the, um, to the ball? Where would it go? It would go toward the back of the room, right? It would bounce off at an angle in kind, right? So the waves do the same thing. When a wave strikes something, even if it's a water wave, right? Water waves come in, they crash against the wall, they're gonna come off of a seawall or something like that at an angle as well. These angles, if you will, so let's just suppose here is the wall. Now let's suppose we have a wave, obviously if it comes in straight, it's gonna go straight back out. But let's suppose the wave travels in at an angle. The point at which it strikes, I could draw the perpendicular at that point called the normal. Okay, so the normal, we already know that term normal means perpendicular. The angle at which the wave strikes the barrier with respect to the normal is called the angle of incidence. The angle of incidence or the incident angle. We'll notate it theta for our angle sub i. Our angle of incidence, theta sub i, is the angle at which a wave strikes a barrier. Now, if it hits it head on, what is the angle of incidence? Well, if it hits it head on, it's traveling along the normal, so what's the angle of incidence if it heads straight at the wall? Careful. Remember, the angle is measured from the normal, so it's traveling along the normal, its angle is zero degrees. Right now, whatever that angle of incidence is, the law of reflection, which I'll have you write in just a moment, says this, it's gonna bounce off at the same angle of reflection with respect to the normal. We call this the law of reflection. The law of reflection. We're gonna look at this quite a bit when we get to light. We're gonna spend a whole lot of time talking about the reflection of light. And the law of reflection basically says that the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. Theta sub i equals theta sub r. And again, we know this with objects, right? With a basketball, right? If you're gonna bounce past it, you bounce past it about halfway to the next person because the angle at which it strikes is roughly the angle it will bounce with. Now again, some energy is lost because of compression of the basketball. So technically you throw it, bounce it a little closer to the person than halfway, but whatever. Um, all things being equal, you know the angle at which it hits is the angle it's gonna bounce off at. But again, those angles are measured from class the normal, not from the surface. Like we would intuitively say, if I chuck a ball at the wall, we say, hey, that was quite a steep angle to the wall. Well, no, we're measuring those angles from the normal, so make sure you have that in your notes. Now, we, I said we're gonna talk about this with light. We could also talk about it with sound, right? I mentioned a moment ago, some rooms, like the youth house, for instance, have to have panels in them to help absorb sound because it's really echoey in there, right? Um, you remember before we had the sound panels, I'm sure, and it was very echoey. It, hard to really focus. Even with them sometimes it's hard to focus in there because it just gets so loud. And uh, so an echo is simply a reflected sound, right? The, oh, and you hear yourself echoing. Well, all that is is the sound striking a surface and coming back to you. So you're hearing the same sound you said. You heard it as it left your mouth. It hits a surface, it bounces back, and you hear it again. Now, if I'm right next to a surface and it bounces off, the sound travels so quickly, I'm basically still hearing the spoken sound as the repeated sound or the reflected sound comes back to my ear. Does that make sense? So in order to hear an echo, the sound has to be able to hit an, a surface that is a good distance away. So by the time the sound has traveled the full distance, I have finished hearing the first sound and I'm now hearing the second. Does that make sense? They found that the distance from you to the reflecting surface needs to be 55 feet so that the total distance traveled class is 110. 110 feet. Basically, there needs to be 100 feet total travel. Now, you might be thinking, Mr. Nasty, there is an echo in the youth house. The youth house is not 55 feet. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you're right. I don't think it is 55 feet. But what happens is if the sound isn't absorbed by other things, it can strike off this wall, then that wall, then this wall, then back to you, and now it's traveled a total of 110 feet. For instance, the, uh, the alleyway right outside this window, well, technically below us and outside that window, uh, my kids have discovered at young ages 
that if you hoo hoo something like that hoo hoo comes back to you or they just like echo echo you know anyway, well that probably actually is maybe that probably is far enough for that anyway but they'll hear echoing off of multiple surfaces or in a cave Right, you'll hear it echoing off of multiple surfaces, things like that. Basically anything that doesn't absorb the sound. So while the book says you need 55 feet to this reflecting surface, technically you just need a total bouncing reflecting time of 110 feet. Now why does the echo sound quieter? Have you ever noticed that? The echo doesn't sound as loud as you say it. Why does it sound quieter? What? Diminishing with distance because sound is a three-dimensional wave, right? So the sound weakens as it's traveling. Another application of reflected sound wave is sonar, right? Used back in World War II times to uh, discover, actually probably even World War I, I believe they may have used it to discover the Unter sea boats, you know, the submarines. And so what they do is they'd send a high-pitched beep. Have you ever watched one of those war movies? Beep, beep, beep. They're sending sounds down and they're waiting for them to reflect off somewhere. And they have charts and stuff that tell them how deep the sea is. And based on how deep the sea is right there, the sound should take this far to travel back through. And based on the speed of sound through water versus through air. And if they get a beep that's too quick, it comes back too early. That also tell them there's something down there where we were sending the sound. And they can use that to make images as well. Now people use it for fishing and cheating in fishing competitions. <laughs> and ah, oh, there's a school of fish down there, sonar. Um, do note this if you were there on page 245. Sonar stands for sound navigation ranging. And um, that's uh, simply a reflected sound wave. And applying this law of reflection. That uh, the angle of incidence equals angular reflection, and that sound will, waves will bounce off of surfaces. Questions on the reflection of sound, or reflection of waves in general. We're actually going to spend more time talking about reflection of light than reflection of sound, but questions on reflection of waves. The next wave behavior we want to talk about is called refraction. Refraction. Now, with refraction, we see the root word fract. Right, which means to break, if you will. Refraction has this idea of a wave traveling along and a wave kind of breaking. Um, now, not to be graphic, but if you broke your arm, that doesn't mean you broke your arm off. It just means your arm's supposed to look like this, and now it's got a weird bend in it that didn't used to be there, right? Um, or as Brian Regan once said, hey, you know Billy? Yeah, you know how his arm used to bend like this? Well, it's not bending like that. Or Noah with his finger the other day before church, he was playing football. And actually, I actually used that one. Oh, his finger is used to bend like this, not bending like that. Anyway, it bends in a way that's not normal, right? Well, normally as a wave travels along, you expect the wave to just, you know, travel along till it hits something. But if in its travels, it changes direction, it's like the wave broke off its course, if you will. The bending of a wave is a practical way to think of it. So in parentheses, write the word bending, and that'll give you the technical definition. But we'll think bending, right? We think bouncing with reflection. We'll think bending with refraction. Refraction is the change in direction of a wave. The change in direction of a wave. It begs the question, why would a wave change direction? Here's what causes it. A change in direction of a wave as it changes speed. The change in direction of a wave as it changes speed entering a new medium. The change in direction of a wave as it changes speed entering a new medium. Well, again, we're going to do a lot with light, with refraction, because it explains a lot of different things that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. But as light changes media, light will change direction. This is why, for instance, you see a little pencil in the cup of water, and hey, the pencil looks like it's here, and then it looks like it's here, or things like that. We'll talk about that all later. It can happen with other things as well, right? Even sound waves uh, will change their direction as well. Now we say, but the sound waves are still traveling through air. That's not a new medium. Well, if you're at places where the temperatures are different, temperature of air makes the wave change speed as well, right? That travels faster through warm air than through cold air. Why? The particles have more energy. What is sound? Is series of compressions or rarefactions, right? Longitudinal wave. Well, if the particles already have more natural inherent kinetic energy because it's warmer, they're going to move more rapidly. And then if you were to go to somewhere colder or the sound were to go into something colder, for instance, maybe you're standing in Hodges Hall and it's nice and cool with the air conditioning on and outside it's 95 degrees in the summer. Well, as the wave travels out the door, it's going to change direction somewhat. Um, the book uses the example of uh, sometimes it's uncanny how people out on the water can hear things on shore really, really clearly. Well, again, as the sound sort of travels outward into the night, 
Remember, hot ground gets heated more quickly than water. Water is the high specific heat, tying it all together here, right? Ground has the lower specific heat, it heats faster, therefore it radiates that heat upward at night. The water has absorbed more of the heat, it hasn't, or it hasn't absorbed as much of the heat, rather, because it's got the higher specific heat, so over the water it's cooler. And what happens is that sound wave sort of bends back down over the water because the sound is changing speed. It also uses the example of water waves in your textbook. Now again, same medium, but as the water gets shallower, the waves have more impedance to their traveling, so the waves have to slow down. As they change speed, the wave bends. And so that's one of the reasons why you'll see at the beach that in sandbar placement, but you'll see the waves sort of seem to change direction as they change speed. You need to know the ways in which they change speed. Now, let's imagine for just a moment that here's sort of the boundary, not, not, a, not a boundary it's gonna bounce off of per se, but a boundary between medium. Maybe this is warm air, cool air. Maybe this is deep water, shallow water, whatever. Waves are traveling fast here, and then they have to slow down here. And let's, now again, if the wave is traveling head on, you're not gonna see a change in direction. But if the wave is traveling at a bit of an angle to this boundary between the faster speed waves and where the waves are gonna be forced to slow down, we could again draw the normal. We still would refer to this as the angle of incidence, but the wave on its natural course should continue going like that, correct? If it just continued on its natural course. But when a wave slows down, it actually bends in closer toward the normal. We need to know that for refraction. When a wave slows down, it refracts toward the normal. So the wave's natural inherent energy that it is carrying would continue in a straight course if it's forced to slow down as its energy diminishes. It's going to refract in toward the normal. Well, you can imagine what would happen if the roles were reversed, right? For instance, let's suppose it's in a medium where it's forced to go slower, and it suddenly enters a medium in which it's able to speed up. Well, in that case, again, instead of maintaining its true course, it will refract away from the normal. In either case, you see how the, the wave doesn't keep its same direction. It deviates. So as a wave speeds up, it's going to refract away from the normal. I'll just draw perpendicular for normal because I'm lazy. All right, as a wave speeds up, it refracts away from the normal. We're going to look at the effects that this has on light as well, right? Light traveling from air to water, for instance. Light slows down as it gets to water, hence that produces that refraction effect that we've seen before with the pencil in the cup thing when we were little. Oh, the pencil broke. No, it didn't. It's just the light. Now, how can we remember this? Okay, this is, this is stupid, but I figured this out a couple years ago because it helped people remember. Imagine your garage, all right? When do you slow down in reference to the garage? When you're going toward the garage, right? You slow down as you go toward the garage. If you speed up toward the garage, we've got problems, right? And that's where we are farmers. Bum, bum, bum. Anyway, um, so hit the wrong pedal, right? Oh, that was the gas. I meant to hit the brake. Okay, you slow down when you're going toward the garage. However, as you're leaving the garage, you would speed up as you go away from the garage. Speed up away, slow down toward. Maybe that'll help you remember. Uh, it's helped students in the past. If it doesn't help you think of your own cool way to remember it, that's how we can remember it, though, if that helps. Again, refraction and garages have nothing whatsoever to do with each other but if it helps you remember, okay? Questions on refraction. All right, the last wave behavior we need to know is called diffraction. D-I-F-F-R-A-C-T-I-O-N, diffraction. Diffraction is the spreading out of a wave. The spreading out of a wave after it passes through a narrow opening. Diffraction, diffraction is the spreading out of a wave after it passes through a narrow opening. Now, one-dimensional waves can't do this, right? If a one-dimensional wave comes to an opening, it goes through it. If a one-dimensional wave doesn't have an opening, it bounces off, okay? That's all they do. But two- or three-dimensional waves, as they reach a boundary, they can spread outward. The book gives you that illustration, if you will, of water waves traveling along and they come to a narrow gap. Well, as the waves come in, for instance, pushed along by wind and tide, they're really kind of functioning 
in the capacity almost of a one-dimensional wave. You see the wave fronts coming in steadily. But because it has the capacity to be a two or three dimensional wave, as it passes through, you see that spreading outward. It almost has that ripple effect outward. It spreads back outward. Practically speaking, sound waves do the same thing. If they didn't, you wouldn't be able to hear things, for instance, on the other side of the door. Sound travels, for instance, under the door, and it spreads back outward so that people can hear. Now, it weakens, perhaps, because some of the sound is blocked, some of the sound reflects around, some of the sound is absorbed, but as the sound travels through, it spreads outward. Also, if it didn't spread outward, if somebody were standing behind Michael, and sound waves hit him, right, three-dimensional waves hit him, and he's blocking them, and they just go right past him. Well, they don't. As they pass him, they also regroup, so that if you were standing right behind Michael, you could still hear sound. So there's also, if you would, put this also with that, or the recovery or regrouping after passing an obstacle. And the same would be true in water waves as well. As water waves, if they were to strike a rock, you'd get an initial splash, but then the wave would keep going. You would still see wave movement on the other side of the rock. Why? Because the wave regroups itself on the other side. So diffraction can also be thought of as the recovering or regrouping of a wave after it passes an obstacle. So it's the spreading out of a wave after it passes through a narrow opening, or the recovering or regrouping of a wave after it passes an obstacle. You need to know diffraction is going to be most pronounced if the, uh, if the gap, if you will, is about one wavelength large. That's where you're going to see the biggest curvature as the wave spreads outward. Okay, so diffraction is most pronounced if the gap is about one wavelength in width. So here's the gap. If the gap is about one wavelength, you're going to see a more pronounced spreading outward of the wave. As the wave fronts come in toward here, that's where you're going to see the most curvature. As the gaps get wider, you don't see the diffraction as evidently. And, uh, and if it were narrower, you wouldn't see that either to the same effect. So just a, a fun little fact there. All right, so the bouncing of a wave. It strikes something, and it, and it bounces off. It turns back after striking a barrier class. That's called... Reflection. If a wave is changing speed and it bends or it changes direction, that's called refraction. refraction. After a wave passes to a three-dimensional wave, passes through an opening, it spreads back outward again, that's called diffraction. diffraction. And again, these are things we'll look at more as we go through later chapters. Homework for this evening is to read over some of what we talked about today and some of what we're going to talk about tomorrow. I need you to read over pages 241 to 250. Read over pages 241 to 250. On page 250, I need you to answer questions 8 through 11. On page 250, answer questions 8 through 11, 14, 15, and 17. Page 250, questions 8 through 11, 14, 15, and 17. Also on page 251, let's practice with some of the math. Notice no math today, okay? Uh, but some of the math that we practiced earlier in the hour, page 251, do problems 1 through 9, the odd. Page 251, problems 1 through 9, the odd. Let's take a look at all of this tomorrow. I'll also be finishing the chapter tomorrow as well. All right, have a wonderful rest of your day, and you are dismissed.